Here, let's check out the evidence about the assumption we made earlier, uh, which says that the velocity of money stays constant over time. Okay, as we said before, when we put the velocity of money on the same chart with nominal GDP and money supply, because the other two variables fluctuate or um, grows a lot, so it looks like the velocity of money um, stays pretty much constant over time. Okay, but that could be because uh, you know. Um, the other two variables grow so much, so the velocity has been compressed to a very small room or range um, on that chart. So here, let's just put uh, the velocity of M1 and M2 on a chart and see, you know, how true that assumption is on the ground. So the blue curve shows uh, the velocity of M1, and uh, the red curve shows that of M2. All right. Now the first impression you got here is, well, so the M1 is not really constant, right? For example, back in 1960s, the velocity is below four. In other words, uh, a typical donor changed hands less than four times. A year, okay. But if you go and look at uh, like twenty two thousand nine, you find this number is already above ten. Okay, so typical dollar changed hands more than ten times a year. Okay, and then after that they start declining. Okay, so um, there is a, a large variation over time. Um, not exactly as the assumption says, right? You probably also believe that you know M two uh, is relatively more stable, okay? But again, we still need to be careful because um, you know M two is um, less fluctuating uh, or less variation, probably because. It has been put on the same chart as M1, which is more fluctuating, right? So here, um, let me show you. Um, let, let's put the velocity of M2 on a separate chart. Again, this time you would find that um, you know it is uh, less um, volatile than M1. Okay, the velocity of M1, but we still see. Um, a relatively, you know, well, quite a variation. Okay? For example, in late 1990s, we find that M2 uh, is about 2.2. Okay, number of times it changes hands, and then um, back in 1960s, that this number is about 1.8. And if you look at recently in this year, it has been below 1.2. Okay, so there still have quite a bit of variation over time. All right, so that could be, you know, uh, one of the reasons the quantity equation of money um, may not always be true on the ground. Okay, especially during the years or periods or the countries when the velocity fluctuates a lot. Okay. All right, and here. Um, let me give you um, two things you can think about. The first one is if we look at uh, in recent years, we do find that both M1 and M2 declines, their, their velocity declines, okay? And for M1, it actually declines a lot, right? M2, we also find it declines. Uh, in, in this trend, the downward trend actually started all the way back to mid and late 1990s. Okay, now here I want to ask you to think about why. What drives this downward trend of the velocity of money? Okay, both M1 and M2. All right, and then 
uh, also think about how the pandemic affected the velocity of money and think about why all right and the second thing uh, i want you guys to uh, think about is why m1 is more volatile or more variation than m2 all right uh, so later at our virtual meeting we can discuss these two all right now um, the second section of this chapter talks about the social costs of inflation okay and i'm gonna leave all of these uh, for you guys as a reading assignment okay now these um or any other stuff i left for you guys as a reading assignment it doesn't mean these materials are less important okay it does not mean that way and it simply means that you know um, the these materials are more straightforward or Greg Manku the book author already did an excellent excellent job in the book so there's no more I want to comment or explain okay Again, some of these concepts are quite important. For example, here, the shoe leather cost, the manual cost, okay, what are they? How do we define them? Why these are um, the concerns a, an economist would have about inflation, okay? You may find this is um, counterintuitive because if you ask, you know, your grandparent, okay, um, about you know why they dislike inflation they will probably tell you well that's because inflation eats the purchasing power of the money in their pocket right everything becomes more and more expensive you have to pay more to get the same good or service okay that's probably the the reason um, they don't like inflation However, that's not the reason an economist dislikes inflation, okay? We actually believe that if, you know, everything's price changed properly, um, proportionally, then um, that argument the general public believes or perceives is not true, okay? Or it's not that detrimental. Because when we say every price um, goes up proportionally, that includes the wage or the wage rates, right? So, as I said before, you know, if um, in the morning we wake up, you find that, you know, the cup of coffee becomes twice as expensive as yesterday, right? Um, these apps you want to download on your uh, cell phone also you know becomes twice as more expensive however when you receive your paycheck you find that you what you get paid is twice as much as you um, did last month right so everything should stay the same you will still be able to buy the exactly same thing you purchased before okay so again economists um, um, sometimes worry about inflation because of other reasons uh, which are discussed uh, in this part of the book okay so please check them out um, and these are also the fair game of our test okay all right in the next issue uh, we're going to talk about the hyperinflation that means extremely bad inflation okay and we especially want to talk about um, several examples uh, which happened in our history okay now first of all we got to get hyperinflation defined how bad um, an inflation could be if we want to define it as hyperinflation now uh, greg Mankiw gave us a quantitative threshold uh, he said that inflation that exceeds 50% per month uh, would be called hyperinflation. Of course, this threshold is drawn in an arbitrary way, right? Like why, for example, if an inflation rate is 49%, 
Do you believe it's hyperinflation? Of course, I would say yes, right? Um, so this is just, again, give us a, a, a quick or rough um, quantitative sense of how bad an inflation um, uh, or a hyperinflation is, right? Now, let me quickly show you um, the, you know, how fast the price level could change because of that 50% um, monthly inflation, okay? Now, what we're seeing here is um, at the beginning of the year, so we're talking about um, the first day in January, uh, you purchased that orange at $1 each, right? Now, because of the 50% um, monthly inflation rate, by the end of January, you have to spend $1.50 to buy the exactly same orange, right? Now, by the end of the February, the price will go up by another 50%. So you need to spend two dollars and a quarter to buy the same orange you purchased at the beginning of the year, right? Now, by the end of the March, that price is going to be three dollars thirty-eight cents. By the end of the June, eleven dollars forty-two cents. By the end of the August, twenty-five dollars seventy cents. By the end of the year, you lead one hundred thirty dollars and thirteen cents to buy the same orange you purchased at the beginning of the year with only one dollar. Okay, so once again, the pro overall price level increased uh, more than one hundred thirty times uh, in a year. Okay, so this tells us how bad a hyperinflation could be. All right. Now, on the next video, we're going to talk about two real-world examples of hyperinflation that happened in our history. Okay. And um, through that, we will discuss the causes of hyperinflation.